This is Theory of Change. I'm Matthew Sheffield. Thanks for being here. Before we get into today's program, I just wanted to remind everybody that you can go to theoryofchange.show to get access to the archives um, with video, audio, and transcript. And if you are a paid subscriber, you get full access to everything. Um, we have free subscriptions as well. Um, there are some things that are uh, restricted in order to keep the show sustainable. So I encourage everybody to check that out. And then uh, I also appreciate everybody who is a paid subscriber. Very, thank you very much for that. We are also part of the Flux.community network of podcasts. And you can go to Flux.community for more articles and podcasts about politics, religion, society, and media. And I encourage everybody to do that as well. So thank you very much. All right. So with that out of the way, let's get into today's program. As American conservatism is rotting out from the inside, it is slowly being replaced by both reactionism and fascism. And it is a horrifying story to see, but there's also a lot of interesting things to notice as conservatism is rotting from the inside. And one of the interesting things about that is that fascism is just as much an aesthetic as it is an ideology. And there's a lot of aspects to that, but one of them is how there is a new emphasis among the American far right on fitness and on looking good as they define it. And seemingly a focus on a lot of the Greek and Roman people who are known for their statues and philosophy. And so there's a lot of aspects to this and how the interchange with that works with fitness and also how people may be overstating the degree to which fitness may be associated with fascism, which you do see, unfortunately, a lot in media sometimes. And joining me to discuss all of this is Natalia Mailman Petrozella. She is the author of a new book called Fit Nation. And I am glad to have you here. Welcome to Theory of Change, Natalia. Thanks for having me. Glad to take this uh, conversation from Twitter to the screen. So glad to That's be here. That's right. Yes. Cool. Um, all right. Well, so um, you have written two books. Fit Nation is your second book. Your first one was a book that is very relevant to the present moment as well. So let's maybe talk about the first one and before we get into today's subject as well. Sure. So my first book was Classroom Wars, Language, Sex, and the Making of Modern Political Culture. And it's one of these things, I guess, that I should be very grateful for, where it came out in 2015. And honestly, my choice of topic, which was connecting curricular battles over race and sex, at the time, people were like, wait, why are you connecting these things? And now, as we see these battles over CRT and so-called gender ideology flaring up everywhere, now I'm like doing media for that book again. So I'm sorry that the political culture has taken that turn, but I was glad to have done, you know, a decade of historical research um, to help understand its origins. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, for people who may not have heard the term gender ideology, what does that mean? Yeah, so that's a term, and I say it sort of with air quotes, that the right uses yeah. right now to talk about um, what they consider to be the kind of imposition of an ideological perspective on gender. And what they define that as is this notion that gender is socially constructed, that the binary of um, maleness and femaleness is not real, um, that children can choose different gender identities. And then a close kind of addendum to that is that parents don't have a right to know about, um, to know or to dictate their children's gender. And I think a big part of it is also the notion that gender is disconnected from sex, from biological sex. So they, they say that that constitutes gender ideology and that is being imposed on children at schools, often without the knowledge or against the will of their parents. And that is a very powerful talking point right now. It is, yeah, and especially in regards to um, transgender people as well, that, that you see a lot of people, uh, particularly predominantly, but not exclusively on the, on the Christian right, who have, you know, they have really, really believed that this is a religion 
um, an alternative religion that is trying to establish itself. And they speak of it as such. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that actually the real historical origins there, like my book, I'm a historian and I was talking about the sixties and the seventies and a little bit, the 1980s, similar moment to today, but obviously different issues. Nobody was talking about transgender rights back then, but they were talking about this kind of new liberal or progressive approach to talking about sexuality with kids as itself a religion. And they called it sex secular humanism. And what you heard all the time was that the secular humanists have this new religion and it's softening kids up for communist uh, takeover, basically. And they're using sex to do that. And so, you know, I guess jumping right into the uh, somewhat salacious content here, but something that you would hear mm -hmm. all the time was that sex education is kind of priming kids to let go of any kind of sense that this is inappropriate or this is immoral or this is private. It has kids kind of talking about and indulging in their desires. And this uh, will allow children to basically be so caught up in like a frenzy of sexual ecstasy or distraction that they are ripe for being taken over by communists because, you know, their loyalties have kind of been taken away from their family and from, from God and country and family, really. Yeah. And uh, they kind of, and, and that conspiracy theory kind of, I mean, it, it circulated somewhat widely on the political right, certainly uh, within the John Birch Society, especially. Um, and that was one of the focuses of your book as well, uh, because yeah. the John Birch Society was founded out here in uh, California, where I live, Southern California, um, and really had, you know, a huge amount of success out here. Um, and, you know, in a lot of different ways. I mean, it's I the and when we were talking a little bit before the show about how you know the 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 pro historiography of of the american right tended to be mostly focusing on kind of these new york manhattan knights like william f buckley right and the reality was that buckley and his friends were kind of just figureheads they were people that were marching ahead of the parade and pretending to lead it. <laughs> right. And they also, I mean, you know, a book like Buckley's God and Man at Yale, right? That is a very particular kind of conservative intellectual tradition, like the John Birch Society and some of these folks that I'm talking about who are organizing in churches, in coffee clutches, they're circulating like these pamphlets. Is the schoolhouse the place to teach raw sex? Like this is not emanating from a kind of, um, uh, I don't know, elite intellectual culture at all. It's really a kind of much more grassroots effort. And it's one, yeah, that the historical tradition, the historical profession had largely ignored. So as we were saying before, I started graduate school in 2002. And in response, in some part to this um, 1994, I think, essay that Alan Brinkley had written in the American Historical Review, where he said, like, we need to pay attention to his to conservatives. There was just this raft of new literature that was looking at grassroots conservatives. So I kind of came into college. And by the way, I grew up in like a very liberal place. So to me, like conservatism was this like, you know, have I ever met one kind of thing? I'm not proud of my parochialism, but um, there really was a lot of intellectual interest, including my own, in understanding this phenomenon better. And there wasn't really much work at all done on schools. And so that's kind of how I got interested in this as a dissertation topic at that time. Yeah. Well, and you and your current book, um, I think also you you uh took the uh that you you got ahead of the crowd as well once again so congratulations Thanks. on that uh fit nation Thank you. um in now you know especially um i think with donald trump the the rise of donald trump it it kind of reoriented the american right um away from this sort of uh you know anti antiseptic uh anti-government you know we're going to limit the government that we're going to obsess over economics and and things like that and and Trump with his just flagrantly anti intellectual and you know Mussolini esque mean um, it it made them a lot of their people decide that uh, well you know maybe maybe uh, we were wrong to focus on that and our voters don't really like that um, right. Yeah, and there's right. more of this like embodied kind of like red blooded version of, of conservatism. That's what you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so like, like for Trump, like he doesn't have a coherent ideology, really. He, you know, he doesn't have a consistent viewpoint of taxes. You know, he's promised like five or six different versions of healthcare, including saying that, you know, Canada's 
and the UK's healthcare systems are great. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, and the National Health Service socialist healthcare in right. the UK is great, according to Trump. Uh, <laughs> but then Obamacare is bad. <laughs> Yeah. Um, no, I think that that's right. And so that, as you're saying, created this reorientation. And so, you know, the reason that I came on here and that you and I were talking on Twitter is because there has been this kind of raft of, I think, deserved attention to this phenomenon that there's all this kind of like fitness culture activity, which is coded very right wing, right? Um, these kind of, uh, you know, uh, building muscularity and brawn and cultivating pure bodies and kind of elevating an ideology of like unsparing individualism um, through the gym. And I do agree with you that the Trump the Trumpian rupture has something to do to, uh, uh, with the rise of that kind of conservatism. At the same time, it is so funny that Donald Trump would have anything to do with a resurgence of any kind of fitness, anything, because one of the things that was remarkable about him is that unlike any of his modern predecessors on the right or on the left, he like hates exercise. Like you have George Bush, you have Clinton, you have Obama, you have all of these presidents um, about, across the aisle who are constantly saying like, oh, oh, you know, look at me jogging or I like to lift weights or Reagan is posing on a Nautilus machine at the gym. It's uncontroversial because everybody in America thinks exercise is good for you and believes in some way that someone who exercises is disciplined and like has their head on straight. Trump breaks with all of that and he embraces a much older kind of um version of what like a, a powerful leader should look like. He actually um, espouses this kind of 19th century idea about energy, bodily energy, where he's like, you know, you're only born with basically like a battery. And like, why would you use any of that energy exercising every day? He'd say like, I have friends who do triathlons. They're crazy. Like I would never waste my energy that way because he believed it was a finite amount. And he, um, and so he, he really derides all of that. He talks about, you know, he's, Donnie two scoops or whatever with his double ice cream cones, his big red steaks, much more that image of the kind of fat cat as the power broker rather than the, you know, jacked, um, uh, very capable kind of um, fit guy that you're seeing being promoted right now on shows like Rogan or um, or otherwise. Yeah, yeah. No, it is. There, There is a tremendous irony. And, and I mean, that's it's, I mean, that's the thing about Trump and his um, movement is that everything is a hypocrisy and I irony <laughs> simultaneously. You know, like here yeah. you have a guy who's talking about toughness and being strong, and yet he's constantly whining about everything. He cannot totally. shut up about how people are unfair and mean to him and complaining yeah. about them. Um, I know. And it's funny, though, that right now, you know, he's in this um, pissing match with Chris Christie and like, what's his big insult for Christie? Chris Christie? Like, you're so fat, you know, <laughs> they like trade these things back and forth, whereas that's never really been a problem in terms of what Donald Trump thinks is an appropriate, uh, you know, uh, figure for our leader to cut. Yeah, well, and, and certainly he's no uh, statue well, guy himself. Figure himself. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. It's true. Well, but but I guess in the so it's interesting, though, that this kind of obsession with fitness, it isn't coming necessarily from the base, not coming from Trump himself, but it's it's kind of the this refashioning that's happened in the right wing um, intelligence, yes, as, as such as it is. Um, and that that's really who's doing this. And, and I guess probably the biggest uh, proponent of all this is this guy uh, who's been writing under the name Bronze Age Pervert. Um, and uh, he, he's he been uh, revealed uh, to be, he, he, like people knew who this was for quite a while, his name, uh, Kostin Alamaru, and I'm sure I'm saying that wrong. Um, but he's, uh, I guess, a Jewish Hungarian uh, kind of, uh, I guess he did get his, he got his PhD somewhere. I forget where it was. MIT. MIT. Um, and went to my high yeah. school. I had no idea. How crazy is that? Yeah. And <laughs> Sorry didn't, if I, you didn't know if I was uh, outing that, that you were going to save that. But yeah, I was shocked. <laughs> I read, I read that Atlantic article just because it's interesting. And, mm. and I was really surprised to learn that. I didn't know him. I think he's younger than I am, but not that much. We were there at the same time. Yeah. Well, and what's interesting though, about this, this, uh, vibe that you know it, i mean he's really kind of just sort of 
recycling of the aesthetic that people like Richard Spencer and some of these, you know, alt-right people, as they called themselves, mm -hmm. were pushing earlier that, um, you know, this, um, I mean, this idea that they're somehow the inheritors and must be the defenders of the white race. Um, and therefore, they not only have to know the the culture from which they came and take credit for but they also have to defend it um mm -hmm. and part of that includes apparently being physically fit it seems. oh yeah yeah that i mean that and that tradition goes back a long way like i think that the current version of it that you see in some of these alt-right well they're not really called all right anymore but some of these like far right um exercise environments is much more kind of martial than um the people in the early 20th century but one of the things i discovered in my research like long before this was like on cnn every air in the Atlantic was that early enthusiasts of strength training and of exercise often presented it very much as this way to preserve the white race. Less we have to be strong to go to war. But what's interesting about what they were saying is they, um, this was a time when like nobody went to the gym. So they were kind of freak shows for spending this time lifting weights and, you know, kind of caring what they looked like and really suspicious. Like you must be weak in oh, the and head. and the gyms were horrible places. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they, they wouldn't smelly, even count as gyms. Yeah. Filled with disease. Uh, like, yeah, like, and, and they were considered to be places that gay men hung out. So also like really unsavory. And so these early enthusiasts, lucky for this historian here had to like really articulate like, well, why would you do this? Why would you lift weights? Like, why is this good? And so often what they talked about was strengthening the white race. Like think that this is a time, um, when there's enormous immigration to the United States from Southern and Eastern Europe and our kind of racial typology of that time saw those as inferior races, right? Semites and, and so forth. Um, and, you know, uh, enslavement had ended just a couple of decades before. So you also had all these free blacks and you had the expansion of the white collar economy. So all of the so-called like best men are sitting all day at work in these clerk offices. And you should see the panic about this. They're talking about oh, the sloped shoulders and the paunch and the sallow faces. And so there emerged these boosters who are like, this is a real problem for the perpetuation of the race. And they talk about it just like that. And so you've got to go and get strong so that you can have more babies. And one of the things that um, was really remarkable as a historian, and I'm not the only one to write about it, but I, I couldn't believe how explicit it was in some sources, was that you saw these guys and some women talking about women need to cast off their corsets, which were popular among white, relatively affluent women. They need to pick up weights. They need to get strong. I'm reading this and I'm like, wow, how progressive and how feminist and all this. Mm -hmm. And then they say, it's because we need fertile women. And these women of the so-called darker races are popping out babies at higher rates. And if you want to preserve the white race, women have got to strengthen themselves to do so. And the way to do that is by weight training, et cetera. Um, and that's really remarkable. And they talk also a lot about the distinction between deliberate strength training versus manual labor, because that was like a real, as I was saying, a real um, assumption that they come up came up against. Like you're just essentially meatheads, not the word that they used at the time. They said, no, 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 no. I'm not a mere breaker of stones, like just having brute force. I deliberately train for a kind of civilized superior body. So that's in like the early 1900s. And I think we see a version of that today in some of these communities that you're talking about. Although I agree it's less uh, the fertility angle and more the kind of like we've got to prepare for you know a potential a potential race war and also i think we've got to preserve and embody a kind of traditional kind of masculinity when all of these gender roles are in flux i think that's a big part of it too yeah i think so and um i mean in and in the case of the current people you know some of that is also kind of inflected through uh, Germanic fascism, which kind of totally. imported a lot of yoga traditions and physical fitness, um, and which uh, it was also hip hypocritical as well, because Mussolini was uh, obese uh, <laughs> and yet was constantly walking around with his shirt off. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but you know, like there is that consistency or inconsistency. The inconsistency is the only consistency. <laughs> That's a good a good rule for writing history. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so at, at the same time, you know, like there there was also a focus 
there's another kind of aspect of all this that, um, you know, what people now kind of call wellness uh, or focus on nutrition or what they think is nutrition um, and in terms of like herbal supplements and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's a tradition that's been around in the United States for, you know, since the very beginning. Um, why don't you talk about that aspect of things as well? Yeah. So that's a big kind of through line in my book. And what my, I'm trying to explain is how fitness, how exercise went from this strange subculture to being a social imperative where the majority of Americans do not work out, but pretty much everyone agrees exercise is good for you and kind of feels bad. They don't exercise enough. Like I'm generalizing, but that's true. How did that happen? And the argument that I make is that fitness exercise went from being considered narrowly physical and therefore kind of suspicious to being um, subsumed in a larger wellness ideology where working on your body was seen as imperative to being a kind of full person. So by the time it really kind of starts like after World War II, where I argue that we start to worry, um, we start to define health as less the absence of disease and more a kind of overall thriving that is psychological, spiritual, um, emotional, um, and involves working on your body and your mind. And people across the political spectrum really glom onto that. Like this idea of this holistic interconnectedness and also the idea that it's up to you to take control of your health. And that's very powerful among certain activist groups on the left who are like, yeah, self-determination. I'm not waiting for some doctor in a white coat to tell me I don't understand my body. Like I can do this, but it's also very, very compelling on the right when you have, where you have people who are espousing kind of this you know, traditional conservative ideology of personal responsibility and picking yourself up yeah. by your bootstraps. Rugged and saying, individualism. Yeah, rugged mm -hmm. individualism. And like, don't wait, don't be lazy and wait for some pill or wait for universal health care. You just need to get outside and go for a run. So, you know, come on. And so that's really, really powerful kind of across the board. So I would say that wellness ideology becomes so powerful because it has that kind of um, reverberation and traction across the political spectrum. But um, wait, so you asked me like, how did we get? And, oh yeah. And part of that in terms of like junk science and sort of like you said, nutrition with a kind of smirk, because a lot of this uh, advice is not so great within that ideology also across the political spectrum is a deep kind of um, skepticism of institutions, of received expertise, of the government. And so you see people coming out of places like John Birch, you know, talking about like, there's, you know, we got to get the fluoride out of the water. And like the government's trying to, they, they, I don't know if John Birch was against polio vaccines, but there were some who were, um, there's this, that kind of like anti-vax sentiment, but then you also have like feminists who Honestly, I totally understand. Or like, you can't trust big pharma. These are the people who greenlit drugs that gave us cervical cancer, right? And so you have this embrace of like natural solutions and all of these um, kind of anti uh, counterculture solutions, which um, you know have a varying degree of uh, of effectiveness and scientific kind of. Uh, you know, uh, veracity, but I think, uh, that's been brewing for decades. Uh, but really, I mean, we saw in the pandemic that, that really blow up, but I would say, um, yeah, that, that stuff has had appeal across the political spectrum for a long time. Yeah, it has. And, and, uh, one of the interesting things for me that I personally had had some contact with is that, you know, I was born and raised as a very strict Mormon and Mormonism, mm -hmm. you know, it, it literally spiritualized uh, 19th century health viewpoints um, mm -hmm. through what they call the word of wisdom, which was basically a distillation of conventional uh, beliefs among educated people in those days. One of which was that drinking hot liquid was bad for your body and you shouldn't do it. And so therefore the only thing you should drink, like it was like the, it was like temperance up past several inches. Um, mm -hmm. So they were not, you weren't just going to not drink, uh, you know, wine or spirits, but also you were not going to drink um, tea or even anything hot, um, mm -hmm. hot chocolate, even in the, in the original interpretation wow. of that. Um, and, you know, and, and then um, there were, and I mean, I think to some degree people know about the, the origin of graham crackers and uh, as, as a, as a way to, to stop people from, from masturbating. 
Um, mm-hmm. So like th- there is th- this this connection between, you know, religious viewpoints and, and health viewpoints. It's always been there. Um, yeah. And both in this country and, and you know, much older than this one as well. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, if you think about it, it makes an intuitive kind of sense, right? What you put in your body is very intimate <laughs> and very powerful. And so it comes to kind of take on the belief system that you're living in. And I think, you know, it's not this kind of podcast because this is more about kind of ideas, but there are some sort of more. Our, um, prescriptive wellness and fitness podcast that I've gone on because of this book. And, you know, I ask, I get asked questions of like, how do you like sort this stuff out and figure it out? And it is really, really hard because like I was saying with the idea of the feminist health advocates questioning big pharma, there are good reasons to question big pharma. Like, the big food industry really is trying to poison you, right? On the other hand is the answer, to, or I shouldn't say trying to poison you, but they are trying to get you addicted to foods that do not serve your best health. I feel very comfortable saying that, right? I completely understand why there are some people who take that and go like screaming in the other direction. We've got to like plant our own food, et cetera. Like it actually kind of makes sense. And I don't, I haven't figured out exactly how to navigate that or at least give useful advice beyond like, you know, check your sources, look at various, uh, look at various um, news sources, like talk to actual people, not people on the internet. But um, I think one of the really unfortunate things of the past several years has been the weaponization of this notion of do your research, right? Do your own research that QAnon has um, totally taken over. And it's been used as a way only to undermine um, any, any information really, rather than I think to create new information. And I think that's really hard. As a historian, what I always used to say to my students, and I still do, but now I have all these kind of caveats. It's like, let's go to the primary sources. Let's read. Let's not take their word for it. Now I'm like, do I sound like QAnon? <laughs> you know? And so I think it really is hard to figure that out. And I think, though, that acknowledging that difficulty, though, is kind of helpful because you understand that, you know, there, there are people like Bronze Age pervert who I don't have a lot of empathy for, but I think there are a lot of people, especially like during COVID, who are really trying to figure out how to just like live a good life and not get sick and protect their families. And a lot of this information is really primed to like get right in there in that, in yeah. that uncertainty, you know, with like very apparently certain answers. Yeah, yeah. And and one thing I tell people is that it's fine to be skeptical of institutions, but you need to be skeptical of the skeptics also. Right, uh, right. Because ultimately, they're trying to sell you something even more often. <laughs> than, right, right. You know, a government, a government office is not trying to sell you something. Um, right, you know, right. They get their paycheck regardless of what you do or don't do. Yeah, that's a good point. So, um, but so I guess one of the other things that's kind of um, interesting with this kind of uh, right wing focus on fitness um, is that there's um, th- in some regards there there is a, you know, there, there's always been an undercurrent of um, homoeroticism in fascism. And, you know, you certainly have seen that with uh, Bronze Age pervert, but also who, you know, many people have said, accused of being gay. Um, but you know, people have said that Richard Spencer is gay, uh, you know, and, and a number of these, uh, and some of these, you know, all, uh, white nationalist activists are gay. Like there, mm-hmm. there is a guy named Greg Johnson who, um, is a, a publisher of books and he's, you know, a, a, a gay atheist man. Um, and so like in, in some regards, it's, it's almost like this is the only way that, uh, you know, some gay right wing men feel like they can express themselves in a permissible way in this subculture. I don't know. It's weird. That is interesting. So um, I am not a gay right wing man. So like I impute no, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I can't say I completely understand the mindset, but I do think it's important to realize something that is often forgotten in these current depictions of like big muscular men who train all the time is like the alpha male. I think one thing that's really important to realize is that for so long, like well into Arnold Schwarzenegger's celebrity as a bodybuilder in the 1970s and onward, to be a man who was that built and spent that much time on his body automatically made you suspicious for being gay. Like automatically, like when Arnold Schwarzenegger is doing promotion around pumping iron in the like mid, I can't remember if it's 76 or 77, 
he says to a journalist, and pardon my French, he says, you know, I, I'm paraphrasing, but this is the slur he used. He goes, you know, guys, people have got to know that just because a guy wants his body to look nice doesn't mean he's a fag. And he goes on to basically say like how that's his goal to like dispel this. And that really was the dominant idea. If you care that much what you look like, if you spend your time building your muscles, hanging out with other sweaty men, looking at those magazines, spray tanning yourself, that's girl stuff, right? Men are supposed to be interested in the mind. And I think that we forget that now because one, there's really been a mainstreaming of kind of a attention to aesthetics among straight men in the past like 30 years. No question about that. So it's considered less inherently sort of suspicious or dispositive of homosexuality. But that's existed, I think, for a really, really long time. And, you know, again, I don't know so much about these subcultures, but there is a lot of homophobia, of course. And so I think that the fact that this kind of bodybuilding is so much about building masculine strength at a moment when so-called gender ideology is like saying, well, what is a man anyway? And toxic masculinity is bad. This traditionally gay male space actually becomes a lot more acceptable, right? Like, because well, we're getting strong mm -hmm. and we're getting jacked and like that kind of um, eliminates some of what were considered the like more suspicious or subversive um, aspects or, or associations with it. But it's complicated. It is, yeah. And it's, it's almost, you know, like they see uh like uh, the the guy who was married to uh ariana huffington uh, michael huffington he was a yeah a, a gay republican um he didn't for a long time he refused to be called gay uh because he said that yeah. he was he was masculine and so therefore he could not be gay um and, and it's like you know like this is a, a this is kind of an undercurrent of you know far right uh, homosexuality throughout history is that they've always mm -hmm. wanted to not believe that you could, <laughs> that there was another way of being, you know, having that as your orientation. Yeah, well, you should talk to my friend and colleague, Neil J. Young, who has this great book coming out on gay Republicans um, next year. So he's the man to talk about this for sure. And he's actually a gay man, too. <laughs> um, but um, <laughs> yeah, I think that that's right. And I think that uh, is associated with the fact that, you know, of course, in the United States for a long time, to have an out gay identity was very much connected with the identity politics of the left, right? So that was... Um, less acceptable if you identify as a conservative. But something that's really interesting that's um, come through in Neil's work and also in a great book by Clay Howard about the Bay Area and kind of the politics of privacy is, you know, there are quite a few gay male Republicans who are all about small government getting the hell out of our bedroom, right? And especially as those men have gained more economic power, that small government uh, sensibility like works great for taxes too, you know? And so it's not, I think it's like a, not that you're saying this, but it's a simplistic view when people are like, a gay Republican, how is that possible? You know, and I understand where mm -hmm. that comes from. But the notion that gay masculinity is immediately coded as left wing, I think is really, really misguided. And I should also say like, you know, there were theorists in the 90s who were writing about body fascism among gay men in the gym. And they weren't talking necessarily about political fascism, but they were talking about this kind of like unsparing, um, unforgiving hierarchy of kind of the bodily aesthetic of gay men. And that that and and like, you know, that was we talked about that. We talk about that a lot with women, but the gay men had like just as much, if not more of a hierarchy in that regard. Um, that also has a lot of things to do with the HIV AIDS epidemic and the fact that gyms were real community centers for men, but also beyond that, displaying a really fit muscular body in that period meant you weren't sick, right? So that kind of aesthetic was like relayered on um, regardless of politics, but as a matter of almost displaying survival. Yeah, yeah. Well, so we're, lately, I, there have seemed to have it be, it's almost like every other month or so, articles coming out in publications saying, uh, you know, w working out is fascist now. Uh, and you need to realize that. Um, I, like it's, it is a disturbingly common article. And I, it's odd that it keeps getting written. I mean, what, what's your take on that? Oh my Why do God. They keep doing um, this? <laughs> well, I don't know if you know this, but you know, I was a victim of like a major clickbait drama around exactly this issue where I had Donnie Trump Jr. like screaming about me saying, Do you know this or not? 
Oh, I don't know that. No, oh, I was like, are it. you soft peddling this story? Cause you think I might like run screaming. Oh my gosh. So let me tell this <laughs> to you because I think it's relevant. So I write this book, Fit Nation. It's slated to publish very early January, coincide with the Jim Rush. I got this really a good journalist at, at uh, Time Magazine who was interviewing me about the book. She interviews me about the book. One of the questions is like, what's a surprise when you had when you were researching this? The surprise was the story that I told you about how strident some of these early 20th century strength enthusiasts were about women lifting weights in order to make more white babies. So that was like something I mentioned in there. The interview was very long. I talked about many, many other things. The headline that they give it was the white supremacist origins of exercise in America and like six <laughs> other facts or something. It comes out December 8th, tw sorry, December 28th. So it's like right in the middle of Christmas and New Year's. I was actually mm -hmm. in Egypt. I see like, I didn't even see the article first, but I see my alerts like pinging and it's all of the like far right, like the blaze daily wire, like all of those kind of sites. And the, what's the idea? The idea is, Oh, everything's racist. Now woke professor says you can't even go to the gym anymore without it being racist, which was so not the point. And in the interview I had said, I kept, I first thought, you know, you go girl, women lifting weights. And then I kept reading and it's important to keep reading, but this thing took on a life of its own. Hannity was calling me. My brother's watching Fox and friends in some waiting room. He's like, they're talking about you on Fox and friends. God felt like it was nonstop, <laughs> including Donnie Jr. So some of it, I was getting death threats. The president of my university was getting, um, mm -hmm. you know, contacted, I mean, I, the Daily Mail wrote full articles, New York Post. It was crazy. Um, Donnie Jr. gets wind of it. And thank God he didn't mention me by name, but it was easy to find. Um, and he's screaming about this, like woke professor, everything's racist now. They want you to be obese. Um, typical feminist, lazy feminist. Um, so yeah, so that happened. Um, <laughs> this is relevant to your question, I think, because I do think that some of what is driving this like exercise is white supremacy and you need to know this is just like this clickbait media culture that we're in. I mean, you know, that headline was so stupid and I hope you're listening Time Magazine and I tried to get them to change it. It was so stupid, so disconnected from the nuance that I tried to impart with this book and so clearly meant to drive outrage. And I think the clicks of honestly, some not so reflective people on the left who like love that stuff too. Um, and yeah, so I think that that's part of it. On the other hand, I do think that, you know, in a very positive and helpful way, we are looking much more thoughtfully at the ways that like really noxious ideologies show up in apparently innocuous aspects of our everyday lives. The gym is one of them. I mean, I'm glad that this conversation is happening. One of the main things that got me to, interested in writing this book like a decade ago was basically the concept that I had in my mind of like, guys, it's not just the gym. Like this place you go every day and spend a lot of money and sweat and everything is not just about physical exercise. There's a philosophical emotional ideological component to that. And I didn't really know it at the time, but part of that community building, which was happening there was for some folks, absolutely about resurrecting this kind of, um, you know, early modern version of masculinity and strength to resist what they see as the kind of decline of civilization, the weakening of masculinity, um, and the increasing, I think, impurity of the body. And we're seeing that resurging. And I think interest in it both comes from a really good place of wanting to understand our world better and a totally awful clickbaity place that um, is, I, I'm sorry to be caught up in, unfortunately. But people need to realize that just because you're learning about, you know, certain aspects of history of a thing, it doesn't mean in anything necessarily about how it is now or how it was in some other time period. These are just at the, you know, everything is like a, these are just like threads that you're pulling and it's okay to pull a thread. <laughs> yeah. And like, this is interesting stuff, but like one of the things I often ask my students is like, especially because white supremacy has now become such a kind of buzz phrase is when they're like, well, that's white supremacy culture. I'm like, okay, how, you know what I mean? And I'm like, it's, it's often not wrong, but like, it's not enough to just like dismiss it out of hand, you know, or like to, yeah, to call something white supremacy culture just out of hand and not go beyond that. And I think that that's unfortunately what the tone of some of these articles are um, at the same mm -hmm. time giving, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, attention to something really important. Yeah, well, I mean, and by that logic, you know, going to college is wrong because colleges, you know, were owned slaves and they were started right. as Christian supremacist right. indoctrination propaganda centers. Yeah. Um, so therefore you shouldn't go to college, right? If that's what you believe. Right, um, right. But these are like ridiculous perspectives, right? Like these aren't perspectives. These are such sort of purest, ideologically um, driven perspectives that nobody really lives by. These are the kind of things people say on Twitter and then they go to class or go to the gym or whatever. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and, and I think, you know, a healthy aspect of things for the left versus the right is that, you know, people on the left might pop off and say something like that, but it doesn't really have any heft behind it. <laughs> you know, the, the, the people at the top aren't saying, you know what, that's a good idea there. Uh, yeah. On, on the right, they'll go and make a book out of that or a Fox News rant about that. <laughs> yeah, I will say that one of the things that keeps me on the left is that there are these studies that show that like left wing media, et cetera, tends to just like have more evidence behind it. Like there's a higher evidentiary standard. And like that to me means a lot. Um, so yeah, I think that that, I think that's absolutely right. Yeah. Well, okay. So now do you see this physicality based right wing viewpoint as, I mean, is it really going to go anywhere? I don't, I don't know that it's going to. Look, I'm a little scared. I mean, I hope that this is just this extreme perspective and set of people that's going to kind of, you know, that we're maybe paying outsized attention to and that it's maybe not going to go anywhere. And these guys are just going to like, you know, start running marathons or lift weights for fun or something. That being said, like, I think we're remiss to ignore it too much. Look, I'm the mom of a 13 year old boy. It's really hard to grow up as a boy right now. One of the things that I think is so disturbing when you start paying attention to this kind of manosphere and what's being directed at young guys is that there is this real mixture of like totally toxic, miserable, horrible misogyny um, and like just really awful racism, et cetera, it's often bound up with semi-sound advice about the gym. Like Andrew Tate is someone people write about a lot. And like, I try not to listen or watch too much. And thank God my son doesn't watch, or if he does, he doesn't seem <laughs> to care for him at all. But like one of the things that's so noxious about this guy who's literally serving time for trafficking and is like a known pimp who has raped women and like promotes this horrific misogynistic perspective, he says things that are like, get off your butts and go work out. Come on. Like you're going to feel so much better if you put down your phone and you hit the gym. You know what? That's actually good advice, you know, but what's really hard to disaggregate is the way that that gets tied up with this totally noxious stuff. And I think like, this is mm -hmm. not the whole answer, but I do think I'm sometimes a little more critical or, or, yeah, yeah, I guess a little more critical of the left because that's kind of like where I live. It's the educational environments that I'm in. I do think, you know, it's important for people on the left, especially educators, to kind of reckon a little bit more honestly or fully with like what it means to be a young man and what it means to like want to be strong and what it means to, you know, inhabit a kind of mm -hmm. like cis hetero identity as something more than just toxic. And like, if you can like, if someone with a really wonderful, enlightened perspective around gender equality and these educators absolutely exist are like yeah guys like you should go lift weights like that's awesome right you don't hear that as much and i think that mm -hmm. that's unfortunate because there's really wholesome wonderful stuff that comes from building bodily strength for boys for girls like we should not cede this to the right that's really bad yeah no that that is a great point i feel like at, at some point the the left understood this a lot better when the, with this slogan the personal is political mm -hmm. which was very popular you know in the, uh, the so-called new left of the 60s and the 70s um but now you know this idea of in you know seeing your your lifestyle through your politics and integrating them that's it's, it's almost kind of you know kind of regarded as dumb or day class a among people on the left um to do that i think oh I mean, like it's students. superficial like because it's consumerism is that what you mean to some degree yeah like they they and and i don't think that's wrong to say that uh because you know obviously you've got people like Gwyneth paltrow and you know selling all kinds of crap uh to mm -hmm. people and you know so like and 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 being you know progressive isn't this you know a, something you can reduce to buying stuff or being gay is not about buying rainbow shit 
you know, and you know, or being a woman yeah. is not about doing X or Y. None of those things are true. But at the same time, if you if you can't speak to cultural issues and you think it's beneath you, mm -hmm. then you're leaving a lot of people behind. I think. That's absolutely true. But I would say the earlier iteration of the personal is political, which was about like, we need to talk about domestic violence and leave for pregnancy and birth control and like all of those issues mm -hmm. of the body, which were considered like, oh, that's like home stuff. Like that's not the realm of politics. You deal with that privately. That no, we need actual policies to, um, uh, you know, to address that. I think that's still really, really salient. And then I think what you're talking about, yeah, that's interesting. That's sort of like chapter two of the personal is political in the 1970s and the kind of consumer culture of like the me generation and retreats and organic food and, you know, yoga and all of that and seeing those kinds of embodied individualistic practices as a form of politics. Yeah, I think those do get, um, you know, that we cast dispersions on those, honestly, often on the left. But I've resisted that because I think, honestly, casting aspersions on that as political action tends to serve to, like, say, women's consumerism is silly. Like, that's often what those critiques come down to. And I don't necessarily think that's true. And I think that even though capitalism, yes, is deeply problematic and we should, like, criticize it endlessly, fine. But within that, we're not just kind of capitalist dupes. Like, we make meaning in these environments. And some of the first writing I did about fitness was about how these fitness communities, yes, they were exclusive by dint of the fact that you have to pay into them, et cetera. But at the same time, they, um, at the same time, they were places when people kind of like really reconstituted their sense of community, their sense of themselves, et cetera. So, um, yeah, I'm, let's keep the personals political around certainly as Roe is reversed and we have all of these like very, you know, child marriage is back. Like we need, we need that. But I think also this consumerist dimension too, it, it's still really relevant. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's a, a great point and hopefully people yeah. will remember that um, and think about that more because yeah, the, you can't seed, you know, lifestyle advice to the, the fascists. You, you, you can't do that. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Okay, cool. All right. Well, uh, it's been a good, great discussion here today Thank and you. Natalia um, and uh, so great talking to you. Of, yeah. Okay. Well, so where can people find you on Twitter and elsewhere? How about that? So I'm on X slash Twitter and Instagram mm -hmm. at Natalia Petrozella. Um, and I have this podcast, Past Present, my book, Fit Nation. Um, yeah. Or nataliapetrozella.com. Okay. And spell uh, your name for everybody who's listening. All right. Not everyone's looking. Mm -hmm. at Natalia, N-A-T-A-L-I-A, Petrozella, P-E-T-R-Z-E-L-A. Okay, cool. All right. Well, it's been great. I, I appreciate you joining me today. Well, thank you so much. I look forward to this coming out. And thanks for reaching out. It's was really nice when like a Twitter friend, you know, transfers into a more engaged conversation. So yeah, cool. All right, cool. Awesome. Yeah, well, I'll definitely let you know. All right. Yes. Have, have a great night. Bye. You too. All right. Bye. All right. So that is the program for today. I appreciate everybody for joining us. And you can always get more at flux.community. This show is a part of the Flux Media Network, and uh, we have lots more podcasts and articles about politics, religion, media, and society. And of course, you can go to theoryofchange.show to go to the uh, section of Flux, um, where we have all the previous episodes of this program. And you can subscribe as well on Patreon or Substack. So I encourage everybody to do that. And thank you very much for those who are paid subscribers. I really appreciate your help.